Hello, I am Anna Kerr, and this honors capstone, um, I want to talk about some of my work that I've been doing in the Nagrath lab in the Department of Chemical Engineering. So I've worked there for two years, and we develop microfluidic devices, which are smart chips, to uh, first be able to better understand uh, tumor metastasis, and then um, we're working to have these devices as um, non-invasive diagnostic tools for cancer. So um, just introducing microfluidics, um, over the past decade, microfluidics has really expanded and kicked off. Um, there's a variety of applications for microfluidics. Um, one prominent example was that uh, microfluidic devices were used to uh, detect COVID-19 last summer. Um, and so just as a simple schematic of what a typical microfluidic device looks like, you can see in figure A in the bottom left here, um, a lot of the simple devices that we start off using in lab um, just consist of a, um, a polymer um, bound to um, a glass plate and um, there's a channel that's etched out in between um, and then we load up sample at the end that pump it through um, out the outlet. And um, for um, detecting cancer, um, studies have shown that um, using the principles of physics, you can effectively separate out cancer cells, like in this image they're shown in green, um, from everything else um, in um, a patient's blood sample. And so that is the really the um, idea that we are going with to um, you know, better design these devices to cancer. So the phenomena that was shown in that image is inertial focusing. Um, and this is defined as the migration of particles and flow laterally across the channel into well-defined equilibrium positions. So uh, an advantage of using inertial focusing is that um, it can be effective even at really high flow speeds, um, meaning that uh, samples can be processed quickly and um, still um, it also does not require um, labeling of the particles. So it's a really cost-effective method of processing these samples for point-of-care diagnostics. So um, like I said before, uh, we want to optimize our throughput, which is the capacity to feed in samples, as well as the purity of getting the um, target uh, particles that we want to isolate um, in our systems. And so to do this, and we need to, since we need to evaluate our designs, um, typically we take photos at the outlets of our devices uh, to, you know, be able to see how, um, like where certain particles went, they're usually fluorescently tagged. Um, and then we also, um, you know, want to see like how um, the streamlines formed and whether they are, um, you know, well-defined or not. And so, the photos are qualitative, but we want more quantitative characterizations of these systems um, just to be able to say that our devices really are effective. And so uh, today I'm focused on talking about a device that had three outlet channels of um, 200 micrometers width each. So this slide shows our uh, key results. So the device had um, three separate outlets. Uh, the top and bottom channels are essentially identical, and that's where we wanted our cancer cells to flow to, whereas um, the middle channel is where we wanted everything else, um, all the waste um, to go to. And um, like I was saying in our photos, we have uh, fluorescently tagged particles. And so then we're able to um, convert the, the relative fluorescence into, you know, intensity values. And so on these graphs, you see um, normalized intensity on the y-axis, and um, that really helps us um, determine whether effective focusing occurred or not. And so in the middle channel, um, we observed that better focusing occurred at higher flow rates. So um, graph B, you can see a really smooth curve for normalized intensity across the channel. Um, across all three uh, protein concentrations with the cells uh, versus for the top and bottom channels, um, better focusing occurred at lower flow rates. So uh, at 800 microliters per minute, you see um, a smooth, uh, smooth curves for the um, relative intensity. 
Another thing that we noticed was that uh, the stream width differed. Um, so in the middle channel, like you can see in figure C, the average stream width was uh, 37 micrometers. Um, and this state consistent across all flow rates, whereas in the top and bottom channels, figure C down here, you can see that there's actually a difference in the particles we saw um, based on the flow rate. So at lower flow rates, we saw an average particle size of 30 micrometers, whereas at higher flow rates, we saw an average particle size of 20 micrometers. Um, and since we were targeting um, a particle size of 30 micrometers to go um, to these top and bottom channels, we we say that um, the 80 microliters per minute um, flow rate uh, was really the best condition for us here. So in conclusion, this work is being used to demonstrate the label-free separation of cells in solution. Um, one limitation is that the effective separation or recovery of our desired particles uh, gets harder when there's more significant overlap between the target and non-target cell or particle sizes. Uh, but we are continuing to design these devices to um, be able to, you know, better effectively separate our targets that we were looking for. And um, we're really hoping to translate these devices from the bench side, so at the lab scale, to the bedside, um, actually to be used in a personalized medicine sense where um, once we know the um, types of cells, uh, types of cancer cells um, that this patient has and looking at the, the cancer phenotype, that's really able to direct um, the uh, treatment method that the physician selects. Um, so in conclusion, thank you for um, listening to my presentation. Um, and I just want to wrap up with um, a couple of the Q&A questions um, that I had. So um, first question was, how did I get involved in this project? Uh, so I joined the Nagrath Lab sophomore year. Um, my advisor in the chemi department had sent out some emails about um, getting involved in research, you know, um, research labs that were uh, taking undergrads to help out in lab. And so that's how I joined. Um, definitely with the pandemic, I was not able to go in person into lab, but um, thankfully we had a lot of data that we had collected the previous year and uh, no one had analyzed it yet. So that's what I was able to work on for my capstone project. Um, what's another question is what's something that I'd want to explore in the future if I had time to continue with this project? Um, and I would say that uh, I had collected a lot of data on um, running particles through uh, channels of different um, sizes and shapes, like curved channels versus square channels versus um, staircases. Um, and definitely at that time, that's something that really just out of curiosity, I'd want to, you know, understand um, the physics and figure out, you know, like, why do, uh, why do particles go or uh, migrate to certain places in different um, types of channels? Um, that's definitely something that I'd want to um, look into. Um, what's one challenge that I experienced on this project? Uh, definitely, it was just determining what is the best characteristic for describing focusing. Um, I went uh, back and forth on this a lot um, with my grad student mentors um, and, you know, like reading previous papers to see what other people use um, as a metric to define focusing really helped. Um, and in the end, like I tried a couple of different things and then we found that like using um, the focusing width to um, compare that to the particle size, um, that really worked well for us. Um, and I yeah, just wanted to conclude that our next steps are to continue um, designing these devices for more effective separation and higher throughput so that they can really be used as a um, clinical tool in the future. So um, that wraps up my presentation. Thank you for listening.